talk about um, humanitarian technology and um, appropriate technology, in particular as a special case of humanitarian technology. Um, we are going to start, we're though, screen. we're not on screen. Um, we are going to start with, <laughs> with uh, a, uh, a movie. Um, actually, it's a three-part movie um, filmed some time ago, but it's still uh, I don't know, quite relevant and good. I assign this as a homework problem, so I would recommend so you don't have to rewatch it. Just take notes. Okay. Um, it comes in in uh, three parts, as I said: uh, nine minute, nine minute twenty second, and eight minute fifty eight seconds. So roughly nine minutes. Each. So this will be about half the class that we'll be watching here. Um, this is an example of um, participatory um, technology development um, in action um, in um, a village in, uh, I don't know why we're not on yet, uh, in a village in Africa. Very unusual. Just a second. Um, and so, what I want to do is start by reminding you what we meant by participatory technology development. In the chapter, there's quite a bit of detail that I go into that's not um, uh, in the lecture. Um, and uh, Wow, uh, there's a number of important uh, features in that, um, such as building relationships with the community to start out with. Um, there's an old saying in community development that nothing happens except on the back of a relationship. It's the only way things get done. Um, Homan said that, but I've heard it outside other contexts too, so I don't know who the originator of that, that uh, quote is, but I think it's really true. Um, and uh, if that's the case, then your relationship forming is really important. Um, and uh, there's a number of principles there. The first one is probably listen, just, just listen, um, and be an active listener or an empathetic listener. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, you know, try to listen to needs and so forth. Um, nothing's working. Did you try hitting the reset button on the back? The reset button on the back of what? That thing, the big red button or the small button. Maybe that'll help. I see what you said. I don't know what you mean. Nothing's working. Hold on a second. No, oh, it's not going to do anything. I've turned it on twice. <coughs> hmm. It's not showing. I got this in there. This in there. down lights podium monitor huh I've done it well there's the third time I'll do it I'm just turning it on the projection unit and uh, says it's warming up The red button in the corner. The, the corner. Bottom right corner. Of the black. Thing. Oh, that's no. Okay, I'm using those as reset buttons. So. No, that's. I I hit the reset down here on the main unit. So. So I don't know why it'll work third time. I I can't. Um. I mean, the, the light is on, and you can see just a light, right? 
I think the issue, ah. Very odd. Okay, um, let's uh, start then with uh, the water of Iole. Can you hear? Gari <laughs> These water basins weigh as much as 80 pounds when filled. Carrying them for 10 or 12 miles every day, as many African women do, leaves little time for anything else. The women do it because drinking water is a world to struggle daily just to Typically though, this water is not safe water, water. And despite the effort it takes, many of these even die from drinking it, especially the children. Third world, every hour of every day, 1,000 children die from contaminated water, a fact that makes clean, potable water as precious as life itself. In Togo, it is guinea worm, a debilitating waterborne disease that plagues the villagers. This is a tiny larva that, once inside the body, develops into a worm and migrates toward the skin. Guinea worms can grow as long as two feet, causing great pain and suffering. Of those infected, only disabled. <laughs> Though bleak, the situation is not hopeless. Right now, there's a major international effort underway. Its goal, to bring clean and accessible water to peoples of the third world. The effort is concentrated on drilling wells and installing pumping equipment for the most part. During the night, 
1980s alone, governments and international aid organizations have spent $70 billion on such projects. But as soon as the water surfaced, so too did other problems. Le village a su immédiatement qu'il y a de l'eau ici. Oui. Et avant, à, au lieu d'aller à Mou, se sont intéressés immédiatement en venant prendre leur eau à côté de cette pompe. Le, quand ça a commencé à faire des petites pannes, oui. comme les segments, les pistons, tout ça là, je me démerdais pour les acheter avec les chefs du village. Alors, nous sommes en train de le faire comme ça. Mais finalement, et vous même vous constatez que maintenant, ça ne marche plus. Donc, et qu'est-ce qu'on a dit exactement C'est qu'on nous disait qu'il y avait la fête de Baudruche. Ah, la pièce maîtresse. C'est ça, c'est ça. Euh, la pièce maîtresse euh, est en... Ah bon. Oui, oui. The new wells were supposed to bring help to the villages. Instead, they brought frustration especially to the government engineers. Et on a réalisé beaucoup de forage à grand frais. On a beaucoup fait pour que la cadence des forages soit accélérée. On est arrivé jusqu'à exécuter trois forages par jour. Au lieu de un à deux jours en une semaine, il y a quatre ou cinq ans. Et, mais le résultat sur le terrain, c'est ce forage fait à grand frais. Et la plupart sont en panne. Les pompes sont en panne, ne sont pas entretenues. Donc, il n'y a pas toujours d'eau potable pour le milieu rural. Broken and abandoned pumps now dot the African landscape. Skeletons of a dream deferred. Each of these cost over $10,000. But in some areas, 80% of them are no longer working. What can we learn from these poignant symbols of failure? What we can see, in this case at least, is technology alone has not solved the problem. Il faut essayer de savoir pourquoi les pompes ne sont pas réparées dans un premier temps. Si on a les explications, tous les problèmes qui sont autour de ces choses-là, on peut organiser une stratégie. These are Togolese extension agents. It is their job to help villagers understand and implement a variety of government-sponsored projects. They must be good communicators, organizers, teachers, and listeners. They've seen pumps break down in hundreds of villages, and they're trying to discover why. Parce que sans la maintenance, tout ce qu'on fait, tout ce qu'on investit comme hydraulique villageoise, C est, c est, ce serait vraiment un fiasco. Vous savez ce que les villageois nous ont dit Ils nous ont dit que lorsque les techniciens étaient arrivés dans le village, une fois le forage terminé, ils reviendront placer la pièce maîtresse, la baudruche, si celle, cette dernière tombait en panne. On leur a amené seulement la pompe au village, c'est tout. C'est le, 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 le gouvernement qui a amené la pompe, c'est son affaire. Si ça tombe en panne, c'est le gouvernement qui doit revenir Réparer la pompe. Donc c'est ça. Donc ça, c'est ce que nous appelons un mauvais départ. Donc il faut qu'on enlève cette idée que c'est le gouvernement qui viendra encore réparer la pompe et que la pompe est leur propre pompe et les responsabilités les incombent. villagers here in Amusokope to be able to maintain their pumps. The town is on a main road. It has a health center, a high school, small businesses. Even the train stops here. Because nearby streams often run dry, women would walk to a distant pond two and three times a day to fetch their water. As usual, it was disease-ridden. So Amusokope was one of the first villages chosen for a new water system. 
Drilling rigs arrived, and in less than a week, the town had two pumps and clean water. But that was six years ago. So what kind of help will ensure clean water in the villages? Je connais bien le cas de ce village, je suis passé il y a à peine un an. Et ça fait partie des villages, des premiers villages équipés. Bon, au départ de notre programme, on était quand même ce village un peu. Au moment où on leur a demandé de faire un effort eux-mêmes, d'acheter la pièce qu'il fallait pour réparer la pompe, ils n'ont pas cru. La première réaction, c'est de c'est de s'énerver, de les accuser, de les accuser de, de manquer d'initiative, de ne pas faire l'effort nécessaire. Mais actuellement, j'ai plutôt appris à me poser la question si nous avons fait tout ce qu'il fallait pour informer et former ces villageois, euh, pour gérer, pour prendre en charge techniquement et financièrement euh, le point d'eau. Les femmes nous disent qu'elles n'ont pas d'argent, qu'elles sont pauvres, qu'elles ne peuvent rien faire. Mais quand on menait les discussions avec ces femmes-là, quand je leur posais assez de questions, elles sont arrivées à me dire qu'elles avaient pris l'initiative de cotiser de l'argent. Mais où est cet argent Elles n'ont pas connu la valeur, la taille exacte de cet argent-là. Même si on cotise de l'argent en désordre, il n'y a pas un comité, il n'y a pas de responsable pour pouvoir garder ce fonds-là. Il y aura des problèmes, les gens seront découragés, ils ne vont plus cotiser et le problème restera toujours posé sans solution. The story was the same in village after village. One day, foreigners arrived with machinery and pumps, and they produced water as if by magic. Another day, the pumps broke down. The women went back to their water holes. They simply didn't know how to keep the new technology working. The solution to their water problem could not come from machinery alone. An approach was needed to get villagers personally involved with their own water supply. With assistance from the United States, extension agents returned to villages like Ayole. They arrived hopeful but skeptical. Alors j'ai vu pas mal de pompes qui étaient installées dans les villages et qui sont restées en panne. Je me demandais si ce projet USAID qui arrive aussi dans la région, si ce ne serait pas les mêmes problèmes qu'on aura dans les villages. Donc euh, au début, je n'étais pas du tout impressionné pour la réussite de ce projet. D'emblée, moi j'ai dit que le projet va échouer. On se met à la, à la place de la population pour juger certaines choses en pensant que, bon, euh, qu'on m'excuse un peu le terme, qui sont les derniers, ils ne connaissent rien, ils ne pourront pas le faire. Mais quand on a commencé à travailler avec la population, on a constaté qu'elle possédait même certaines choses que nous-mêmes on ne connaissait pas. Oh, les diables, les vieux. 
encourage you. No, uh, no, you are my dog, Bena. I'm not a madame. I'm nine. Caca, go away. Machina came, Machina, me have a little giant amid you. Then for you. Only giant amid you to a me. ACI, obviously, working in proportion, I generally join you. Kisiava, a Jomia Parica, working in Portuno, no horse, no horse. Oh, and the Kemilia Gadi is your Kodemi Kufonua, and then I may have our Jonami out. What can you know? Let me tell me, I will them call it to me. You may be near here, out on me, I bet all. Let me know. Let me see, I wish I would do. Who so for Janaka? What is it? Yato, any name on me, I could see up in Yato. Et si tu la main bague à There's no health clinic in Ayole. No train, no shop. But they do have clean water right here in the village. It has operated continuously for five years. Ayole has succeeded where others failed because Ayole's new well and pump were made a part of village life from the very beginning. Extension agents help villagers to organize a pump committee designate an overseer, and of course, a repairman. Pumps, such as this one in Ayole, are mechanically quite simple. Still, they need a support system to keep them working beginning with a trained mechanic right here in the village. Allez, 
No, you have a Filipina, a Sokoja, a demon, a Yagrimo, Gawamia, Kennedy, Ababa, Majiziba, Nojika, Kasiba, Toto, Pari, Egyptia, Elatibo, Niagroya, Ahome, Antonia, or no, yeah, Niagro. It's been five years since extension agents first came to Ayole. Here, and in other places, they've worked hard getting the local people to take charge of their clean water projects. This kind of village commitment is just what they intended, but to accomplish it, the agents had to go through some reorientation of their own. I pensais que j'avais tous les atouts possibles pour pouvoir encadrer les villages. Mais quand les, les formations ont commencé par se multiplier, vraiment, j'avais vu qu'il y avait une grande différence avec l'approche qu'il fallait mener dans les villages. Et dans ce temps, je, je donne ce que moi je, je connais dans, à ces villages-là. Mais maintenant, je vois qu'il y a une grande différence. J'arrive dans le village, euh, ensemble avec les, les villageois, J'essaye de discuter avec eux et ensemble on trouve des solutions. In the past, it was mostly the men, the village chief and the elders, who decided community affairs. But water is traditionally women's work, so they too were brought into the process. Avant, les femmes là n'ont pas de, c'est-à-dire les, les femmes là n'ont pas de rôle ainsi que tel à jouer dans le village, parce que s'il y a un problème dans le village, c'est l'affaire des hommes. Ce sont les hommes qui doivent décider de tout. Maintenant, les femmes aussi prennent les décisions au niveau de ces villages. Les femmes se lèvent et prennent une décision ferme et le travail marche. Donc, je peux vous dire que c'est un stimulant. Les femmes sont devenues quelque chose un stimulant pour les hommes. Si les femmes se lèvent, les hommes aussi veulent se lever. Parce que les hommes disent, ah, avant, c'est nous qui dominons les, les femmes. Aujourd'hui, les femmes veulent nous dominer. On ne veut pas se laisser faire. Dans ce cas-là, qu'est-ce qu'on peut conclure C'est le village qui se développe. Donc, il y a l'animation. Les femmes sont très motivées. Les hommes aussi sont très motivés. Et avec cette concurrence, le village se développe. The village develops. Along with the pump, the villagers of Ayole now have a new way to manage their affairs. A new way to solve problems, such as where to get the money to maintain their pump. To meet that need, they decided to work together in a communal field. Here they grow cassava, maize, cotton and beans. This has always been a traditional way to raise money for funerals or celebrations. But now it's become part of an ongoing activity. And with the profits, they buy parts for the village pump. They've opened a bank account in town. The funds are controlled by the pump committee, which in turn authorizes the repairman to buy the parts he needs. The Togolese government must ensure that spare parts for the pump are available in local hardware stores throughout the country. For without coordinated effort, this new spirit of self-reliance would soon be broken. Last year in Ayole, the most important part of the pump, the bladder, broke. This single event presented a critical challenge to the villagers and to the strength of the entire support system. After the village mechanic identified the problem, the committee immediately contacted the government's pump engineer. Together, they ordered a replacement and coordinated the raising of the bladder. The pump was back working the next day. En début de carrière, quand je vois l'eau jaillir, j'en suis très heureux. Mais actuellement, quand je vois un point d'eau bien entretenu, un village mobilisé, organisé, qui a pris en main son point d'eau, euh, j'en suis très fier. Et vous savez, la prise en charge du point d'eau en milieu rural n'est pas seulement <coughs> une question de fourniture d'eau potable. C'est <coughs> le signe que le village est capable, à une certaine maturité, pour amorcer un certain processus d'autodéveloppement.
sont capables en ce moment de gérer, s'ils arrivent à gérer le point d'eau, c'est qu'ils sont capables de gérer n'importe quel autre projet de développement. Today, ILA is busy with new projects. Villagers have organized to build latrines, a new school, and a second pump. Theirs is not a rich village, but it is a determined one. The success of Ayole has taken years of hard work by villagers and extension agents, as well as engineers, government officials, and others, all committed to eliminating disease and improving village life. Je sais que c'est un peu difficile, mais l'espérance, et je pense qu'on peut atteindre les objectifs signés, les objectifs qu'on s'est fixés, les objectifs fixés par notre pays dans le domaine de l'autosuffisance alimentaire et dans le domaine euh, de la prise en charge des problèmes de nos communautés rurales. The Ayole experience is now shared by 700 other villages throughout Togo. The overall success of this water project has inspired optimism throughout the region. But the effort has only begun. And for well over half the population of the third world, more than a billion people, the water of Ayole is still only a dream. Um, so, discussion, what was, uh, just pick, I mean, there's a lot in there, right? I mean, that's almost a, it's like a summary of, um, the lectures, the last several lectures we've been doing, um. It's, it doesn't have everything we talked about, but it's, it's a fantastic example. Um, and so, what was striking to you? Yeah. Uh, well, I talked about this for a super long time since what my capstone is, is the Tanzanian uh, water supply thing. But, A, I thought that the success story was super encouraging because with stats like uh, a well lasts on average four to six months, before parts are needed and things like that. It gets pretty uh, pretty discouraging pretty quickly. But uh, yeah, I thought that it was nice that there's a success story. Uh, it's true that women make the decisions over there based about water. Um, sustainability is definitely the most important part of those designs. We have, we've been doing design or decision matrices all semester and when we figure out what criteria are under which category, sustainability accounts for about 50% of everything that drives decisions. Yeah, I like it a lot. Uh, it's pretty cool, isn't it? I mean, it, it sort of, you, you, you can see people issues and technology issues, right? Yeah. And what an intimate connection between the two and for success, right? I mean, and then, the implication, anyway, what, what else? Anyone? Yeah. Uh, I think the biggest part was like how the first project failed in some of those places. Um, I, we always talked about like how like, they would be discouraged because past projects fail, but I was like, that was kind of abstract to me. And I was thinking like, why would a project just fail and they would come back and try to make it better? But I get kind of get a more solid example now. Yeah, it, it shows how things can fail. I mean, it's just, things break down. All technology breaks down, right? Yes. It was most striking to me the way that the village had to re 
reorganize in order for this to become a, uh, something that was maintained. Um, like that's not, you know, when you're going to you know, give some, you know, try to fix a technical problem, you're not expecting that, you're not necessarily expecting that the, you know, that the people that you're working with will have to reorganize themselves and their, how they relate to one another in order to make it possible. The whole life of the community changed yeah. as a result of this, right? It's fascinating. Anyone else? Yes, Daniel. Um, I found it interesting how we, when they were communicating together, both of the, the villagers expected the government to fix the water pump, yeah. whereas the government expected them to take care of it. Without that communication, everything just stopped. Lots of communication problems, right? <laughs> Early on, everybody's pointing fingers at each other. Well, you were going to do this. You're going to, you know, all. It's just, it's just poor communication, right? It's sort of the old idea, a helicopter in a solution, and I walk away. You know, well, the problem, that's clearly problematic in this case, okay? Anybody else? Yeah. So I've heard a lot about the, um, some pumps failing and just being such a simple problem, like a 99 cent O-ring or something. It's just the people don't know how to fix it. They don't know to fix it. So I mean that, but it's still just surprising seeing it. But what really surprised me was the women empowerment thing. I, I just I hadn't heard or thought of that before. I just thought that was really crazy how it changed the whole dynamic of the village and it changed all their traditional values of running the whole village essentially. Yeah. So that's this a is thing. a very common phenomenon around the world where the women are responsible for getting the water or the uh, children, right? And. Uh, um, yeah, it really changes the dynamic. It very much empowers the women. Um, I think my favorite part was actually that they trained someone to come in and, and like work on the pump because that's kind of the beginning of like a STEM education system in that in that community. Because at some point he needs to pass on that information to someone because he's not going to be around forever, I assume. And so, like you know, he's going to pass on to maybe like two or three people, and then all of a sudden they can like the phrase they use is mechanics, and like all of a sudden they can do mechanics, and then like, it's just kind of, hopefully, hopefully, some type of like waterfall effect where it just kind of cascades down, and then like, you end up with years of experience that gets passed down to new generations, so I think that like, hopefully at some point, there's a way to get like, one of those people who like knows how to work the pump and knows how to fix it, have to get them to college, because they think that that's also a very big, and leave their village so the pump will break? <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm hoping to the village to more than just one person yes. in the village. Yeah. Um, but I think that's also a good, um, just kind of like a, a good stepping stone is starting with issues at home and then connecting it to the wider world. Yes, yeah, so, you know, this is the issue of technological capacity that we've talked about several times already, back even with social justice, et cetera, and, and education is a crucial part to a project like this. This is really makes this tangible. Um, you have to educate people how to operate things, how to fix things, and uh, so, and then how to set up a committee, how to manage this, how to manage the finances, and so on. Yes? Uh, to that point, a lot of programs are now starting to fold the mechanic training into it, like Oxfam's Blue Pump and Design Outreach Program. Form. Yeah install until they know that they're going to be able to train someone. Right. So there's been a lot of lessons learned, essentially, by past failures. And, uh, you know, people, uh, these, are, these are difficult issues to try to do development right. And especially, you know, you're centering it around a technology. I mean, it, what's fascinating in, in some, this is a great example of humanitarian engineering, right? It's, it's a technology, um, you know, mechanical or civil or whatever engineers design these technologies and the quality of the technology matters the reliability matters all kind of ease of fixing it just think of all the constraints for the design you know uh, so and yet if you're done if you got the design done <laughs> you're not done right there's all this people stuff around it and they're experts at dealing with community organization those people like social workers okay so we need partnerships with, with them for the people side of things too, I think. Anybody else? Comments? Okay, I'm going to um, uh, move on then. Um, so uh, let's talk 
for a bit about um, what happens after you've done participatory technology development. So you, you, you did uh, concept generation selection and testing. And then there's an availability problem. You, you, you start out, you say, well, we need a technology that does this. And it may be the case, there's no technology invented to do the problem you're trying to solve. You should, every, there's an old saying, every problem is local, period. Every problem is local. So you start from that assumption. You don't assume that every village in Togo is gonna to be identical. And you, you know, there's gonna be different situations and you try to put the technology together for them. Now it might be there's a number of cases that are quite similar and you may be able to go with one pump design in a, quite a number of regions. But that's, that's kind of luck and kind of because a lot of regions are similar sometimes. Um, there may be a related technology to what you need, but you have to modify the technology. I mean, pumps have been around an awfully long time, right? So, but new materials for pumps are coming available all the time and new approaches. So you sort of have to stay up and you mo typically modify a design. A lot of engineering is about modifying a previous design, right? Sometimes there's an off-the-shelf technology. You buy a pump, you install it, and the rest of it's people problems and maintenance and the technical issues and capacity developing um, it challenges. Um, so there's sort of a spectrum between a mature technology off-the-shelf perhaps and the so-called bleeding edge technology. Some people call it a cutting edge. Um, and you want to be somewhere on that spectrum. Typically, you really want to avoid the bleeding edge because those tend to be fragile technologies, not well-tested technologies, not robust. They're going to fail quickly. They're typically going to be hard to repair. Okay. Now, as a professional engineer or professional humanitarian engineer, uh, you got to know all these cases. That is a challenge. Okay. Then you pick based on the maturity of the approaches. Generally, it's not a good idea to have a pet technology and then search um, for solutions. In other words, have a solution looking for a problem. That's generally a really, really bad idea. Um, sometimes you run into a problem and it, it, it really makes a lot of sense to chip away at the problem. In other words, give a partial solution with the technology, fix it again in five years type approach. Um, and of course, you pay attention to innovation. Now, there's a number of ways to approach designs. Um, so from a social justice perspective, you might seek the worst problems. In ILA, uh, someone chose to get at one of the most basic issues, right? Um, water for survival is arguably the most crucial issue. And then food, and then a lot of other stuff, okay? Um, so you might focus on technologies to promote human rights or essential human capabilities, a la Martha um, Nussbaum. Okay, but there's coupling between all of these, and um, in promoting human rights, sometimes something can happen that you didn't expect. I mean, this this what? Who would think that a water pump would promote women's rights? Right? Who would think? But it actually comes back. And remember our early discussion about discrimination. We said can technology and discrimination. We said nah, probably not. Eh, via targeting, it can. So what targeting means is something like this. You target something will have a significant impact on women. If you, if you want to improve the plight of women in the world, that's the sort of thing to do. Focus on water is clearly going to have an impact. Okay. So I think you can affect discrimination in some ways with technology. It just might be an indirect effect. Next, uh, <laughs> I got this example from a student class last year, um, Andrew Fenner. Uh, and I want to discuss the human right of rest and leisure. I've mentioned this once before. So Andrew uh, was working in Kenya on a humanitarian engineering project, and uh, he, was, he brought his tablet, you can see it right there, along, and he said they didn't even have electricity even in this, where he was at, but it was still charged. And he was playing one night um, with children. This is, uh, maybe you're familiar with this game, some kind of a hockey game, okay? And uh, some old gentleman was back there watching, and he asked if he wanted a turn. Yes. And the guy said yes. And the guy apparently was just laughing, and, and he kind of w was hiding his laughing, though, he 
thought it was so funny. The whole thing was so much fun for the guy. And late, so he walked away, and Andrew was talking to the children about him. And they said they had never in their lives seen this man smile or laugh. So you, you ask them, so is it a humanitarian act to do this? I think so. Okay. Next, design constraints. One of the problems when you go to ILA or the likes um, is the issue is that you often have extreme design constraints and therefore there are differences, significant differences compared to technologies you might design for the US or Europe. Okay? So you often need something that's very rugged, reliable, robust, resilient, however you want to put that, has much lower cost, maybe one tenth the cost or less uses local materials and maintenance, we just saw why, uh, has a uh, you know, small size, low weight typically, um, has, doesn't have problems with safety and risk, and we know the importance of environment and sustainability. These can be really significant things. You know, technology we, we design for the US and you take to the tropics, which you know, a sizable portion of the developing world is in the tropics, you know, it's different. I'm mean, talking about temperature differences and humidity differences, right? Um, so you can't assume that your technologies here will survive there necessarily as long. And that, that can create really quite significant um, engineering challenges. And then sometimes there's unusual design trade-offs like ruggedness versus cost or ease of use versus reliability or functionality and ease of use versus cost or cultural issues. Let me give two examples here. Um, Dr. Bixler, who does the Life Pump for uh, Design Outreach, I think a lot of you know about uh, what he's done. Um, he has an interesting story. He's talking to the villagers and he's saying, okay, we've got two designs. We've got one, there's this, this crank method. It's difficult to, to pump the water up with this method, but we know this pump's going to last a lot longer, several years longer. Or do you want the easy to pump thing that's going to break down within a year? And they say, the hard to pump one. We want to make sure it works longer. In the US, typically, what do we say? Give us the easy pump one, and we'll just buy another one and get it fixed, right? So this, this is an unusual trade off. And how did he know how to trade it off? Simply ask. Okay? Another one classic example of humanitarian engineering with pumps is. Uh, an example where uh, there's something called a treal pump, where a treal pump, you, you get up on the, uh, the pump and you, you do this, okay, you, you pump with your feet, uh, it pumps water up. So since uh, water is women's work, um, the women would do this, okay, they get up there and pump on the treal pump. This technology failed. Why? Well, women could do it. The problem was the men hung out all day and watched the women do this because they're shaking up on the pump. So the women reject, the, the village rejects this thing. Com the technology completely fails, and you gotta go back to the drawing board. That's a cultural issue, okay? It does impact your design. Next, appropriate technology. Very important idea in uh, humanitarian engineering. Um, starting with Gandhi and Schumacher, it's a focus on small scale, um, people and cost efficiency, energy efficiency. Um, it's sort of an open source approach. It's a, appropriate technology is always shared with, with others. Um, usually we categorize them by matching the needs, but I'm going to categorize them here slightly differently. Um, so there's personal technology. So sometimes, you know, if you go in a village and they don't have the electrical grid, the government hasn't put it in, you design a way for them to a personal electricity generation system, such as a bicycle or something of the sorts. Um, this certainly has a big role in participatory technology development and human-centered design. And there are roles in modularity. I'll give an example here in just a second. Uh, some classic examples of, of uh, appropriate technology. There's a lighting systems. They've been around for many, many, many years. The most, one of the recent popular ones is something called D-Light. Um, you can study if you like. You can have modularity for these. This is a, an unusual technology. That's a cell phone. You can incrementally buy it over time. You know, you can buy more memory or other features and just slap it together. And you say, why in the world would you do that? Well, if you don't have much money 
Now you got you're getting a dollar a day. Maybe you can afford a certain amount if you keep, you know over time keep buying pieces of your phone. And this is this is said to be a very important idea for people at you know at the so-called bottom of the pyramid. Um, community technology. A pump is a community technology, right? So there's n greater than one users. And why do we do it? Because it's more efficient than putting little pump, bunch of little pumps for people or it's better than taking the water from the river that the ladies were using and trying to purify it. It made sense just to dig a pump and then do the whole village at once. Okay, That can also happen not just with water but with electricity, right? It makes more sense to generate electricity if you study it, centralized and distribute to people than it does to have n people with different personal electricity generating systems. There's good reasons for community technology. We use it all the time, right? Most of the services you're getting are community technology, water, sanitation, energy, gas, electricity, right? All this stuff is community technology. So there's lots of advantages and disadvantages. Some examples um, that you might think about um, are some of those listed above, including a village truck that can be shared and maintained. And then there's modular cases, such as in um, drip irrigation, so the way these are set up for you ag people, you know all about this, but you can add zones with these pipes and expand it as you get more money um, to irrigate your crops. Next, design for cooperation. I'm going to be taught, I just want to mention this and I'm going to go on. Uh, I'm going to come back to the water ILA in the technical part that we're going to cover um, in this chapter and talk about the automation of that cooperation problem. Okay, and whether we'll discuss whether it's a good or bad idea. Final comment on um, scale up means you take your technology because it's so useful and you try to scale up to the world. Okay, I think the best example comes from uh, the MIT D Lab, which was started by um, Amy Smith, um, and uh, she invented with her teams from MIT something called uh, Cane Coal Project. Um, this is a project where they're, they come up with a uh, a way to create charcoal out of local materials in a very inexpensive way. They are now in the process of expanding this in Africa and really trying to scale it up big. Okay, we've got an OSU grad, Eric Reynolds, who works there with Amy at the D Lab on um, scale ups. That's his responsibility to teach a class on that. And uh, if you want to learn more about Amy's uh, project, just Google her or search and go to the TED site or and search on her or go to the home, there's a homework problem on, on uh, her project, okay?